So, Happy New Year, everybody. We're starting our next year, and um, today we had pretty good registration for this event. We have two speakers who will present us a topic on intelligent authentication. And uh, let's start. Cool. Okay. Well, I'll kick off straight away if we can jump to the first slide. Um, so just to make sure that everybody's got the same grounding, I expect that some members of the audience already have a, a good understanding of these topics, but to make sure that we can build from the ground up, um, talk about authentication and authorization, two topics which are uh, very highly related. So authentication is, uh, put simply, the act of, of proving uh, that you are who you say you are to somebody that you are claiming that to. Um, we do it all the time uh, and online. Uh, we often do this simply through usernames uh, and passwords. Authentication is a very basic process um, for, for the most part, and what we try and do is make it as easy as possible for uh, all the users. And by all the users, I don't just mean the end users, those who are actually going through these login forms, but I mean the people that are developing the authentication, uh, what I call mechanisms, uh, what other people may call methods or modules, um, as well as the administrators that have to configure this, uh, the journey, the authentication journey that uh, an end user goes through to be able to access a service. So at a very high level, there are three types of uh, authentication factors that you can challenge any given individual on. Um, knowledge, something that the user knows, and supposedly only the user knows. Most basic of these is, is your password. Potentially, it's also your uh, answers to your knowledge base questions and, and so forth. Absolutely. So jump in straight away. Yeah, so knowledge based authentication is something we frown upon, but you've probably all experienced that. You know, what's your mother's maiden name or something like that? It's, we, we hate it, but it still exists. But that's knowledge based authentication. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that in a second. So ownership is our, our second uh, element, and ownership is uh, simply an object that only you are supposed to have access to or supposed to have on, uh, on your person. And um, I think most of us carry around a lot of these today, even if we don't use them for that purpose. Um, my phone, there are some USB tokens on the desk here. Smart cards. Smart cards, yep. Um, yeah, so, um, RSA tokens, if you use those, uh, code generators and so forth. Um, all of these are examples of ownership factors of authentication. Um, and finally, inherence, which is definitely the most interesting of the three authentication factors and the one that, although not frequently called inherence uh, in, in the general, general press, um, is, is the one that's getting all the, all the traction these days. And that is your things that you are and, th and, and also things that you do. Uh, things that you do is often slightly neglected when we talk about these things because biometrics are the really exciting topic of the day. Um, but inherence covers your fingerprints, your facial recognition, uh, your gait, if you're uh, using those kind of things. Any other obvious examples that we tons, see but, these days? But in essence, it's like... Yeah, 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 yeah so sure. That's a good one. Um, so it's like uh, something you know, something you have, and something you are. That's kind of like... Um, the three different factors. Yeah, sure. Um, and a quick nod to the concepts of single sign-on, SSO, and federated authentication as well, as these topics may be mentioned throughout the talk. Uh, single sign-on, simply using your credentials from one service to access another service without having to use your credentials a second time or type them in a second time. Um, and federated authentication, the ability to transmit your uh, kind of the attributes about a user from one service to another so that that information uh, is duplicated. And again, you guys have probably all done this. Uh, 
with things like using your Facebook ID to log on to some, well, some servers out there at Federation. And what about GDPR? GDPR? What about it? Yeah, it's something that everyone needs to be very, very concerned about. Uh, and the services that you use, are it's on them to be able to prove that they are complying with the terms of the GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, so how uh, authorization um, and, and how does authentication relate to authorization? Well, authorization is can any given individual access the resource or perform the action that they're trying to access or trying to perform? Um, and these are often specified through policies. Um, policies can take the uh, form of a static, all users are allowed to log into this, only users of this group are allowed to log into this, or they can be much more dynamic. They can assess uh, context at the time that an attempt to access a resource is given and then determine the outcome based on that. Um, authorization also includes the idea of being able to send advice back to the uh, to the place where the user is uh, trying to perform this uh, action. Um, and those advices can take many forms. I've listed a few here on the slide. Um, I understand it may be a little hard to read at the back of the room. So we've got step up authentication. So challenging the user to provide a higher level of authentication uh, when they try and do a, a harder task. So for example, if you log into your bank just using a password, but then you try and actually transfer some money to an individual to whom you've never transferred money before, then your bank may challenge you with a step up authentication, uh, uh, asking you to use a key that you're supposed to own. So using an ownership factor as well. We call this multi-factor authentication. Um, but we can do more than that. We can simply log out the user if we think there's a risk, uh, or we can put notes on a user's profile to say this user must reset their password, or even as the information is coming out of the resource, we can use that opportunity to redact or add to the information being displayed. So how do authentication and authorization uh, occur? Well, I've drawn a pretty block uh, flow diagram here. So I'll walk you through it as some of the numbers may not come in the order you'd expect. Uh, first of all, your browser, your user agent, your individual requests access to the resource. And in the middle here, we have what we call a PEP, a policy enforcement point. Um, in the case of Fordrop, the company that we both work for, we have a product called IG, uh, Internet Gateway. Um, and this can question what we call a PDP, a policy decision point, to say, uh, do you have the cookie, do you have a token allowing you to uh, access this resource already? So in this basic flow, the user is logged out, the user wants to log in to access a resource, so we say, no, you don't have currently any token associated with you to say that you uh, are logged in, so we'll redirect you to our policy decision point. In this case, our policy decision point is also acting as our authentication agent. Um, so you can imagine off to the side of the uh, green block there that there is a data store of users, whether that's LDAP or whatever else, um, and we ask the user to authenticate. And here we are at stage three, user authenticates, and we'll go very deep into the concepts around authentication later on, but for now, we'll say authentication has happened, so we mint a, uh, a token, a, a cookie in the, in the browser world, and we redirect the user back to the uh, requested resource. Now all that happens here is the browser requests access to the requested resource again. It's not anything special, um, but this time when the PEP asks the PDP, does the user have access, we actually get the response, yes, we don't need to perform any specific action. So upon doing that, uh, the PEP allows access to finally the resource location, I've labeled it as an application, um, and we request the resource, we retrieve it from the application, and here, as I mentioned before, is the opportunity for the PEP to maybe make some alterations to that resource if it so chooses. Otherwise, it passes it straight through. And that's a standard flow of authentication uh, and authorization in everyday interactions. And you, 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 this, this flow is occurring everywhere, every time you're using a resource online, even if it may not seem uh, that all these components are necessarily explicitly involved. Yeah, just to make that real, a couple of real world examples of this. Um, if this was, for instance, Amazon.com, you're trying to buy something for uh, Christmas, you're a bit late, but um, this is your browser or your mobile application over here. Um, Amazon uses a really kind of soft authentication mechanism. When I go to Amazon, it doesn't ask me to log in straight away. It says, welcome back, Andy. And I think, I haven't, I haven't logged in, you know, how, how does it know? And it's, of course, it's just using a cookie um, to, 
to remember who I am. And it lets me do lots of things. It, it kind of like is a key into who I am, so it gives me stuff that I might be interested in. But when I, when I eventually buy something and we get to the financial end of the business, it will then ask me to log in. And that's where I, uh, basically the service I'm trying to access over here is checkout. And the protection in front of that will say, oh, you're not authenticated to a high enough level in order to perform that transaction. So you need to go and get authenticated to whatever your um, authentication system is right now. And when you've done that, you can come back to me with um, a token. So we do this, and then we come back in and we're allowed to check out uh, Amazon. Or another example is in the kind of like the workforce world, maybe you're working for a company and the company's just decided to go with to Salesforce. So you're going to use salesforce.com to do some of your ERP type stuff. So, so what you don't really want to create credentials for every service out there that you're accessing across the network. So what you can do is, the red bit is Salesforce. This can be your company IT system, which is maybe on your own premise. So this might be something like Active Directory or um, uh, Forge Rock Access Manager. And so what will happen is that when you try and access this salesforce.com, Salesforce says, who are you? What's your email address? And I would say, well, I'm Andy Hall at forgerock.com. It says, aha, I'm going to send you over to the forgerock.com authoritative source to check, to, to get him to log you in because he knows more about you than I do. So you log strongly into here. We issue a token, which then gets, uh, you come back to Salesforce with the token, say, I've got a token now. And he says, you know what? Because I trust Forge Rock down here, I'm going to accept that token and you can come in. So that's another example of um, authentication in the real world. So now that we've talked about authentication and authorization, we'll come back to authorization later on in the talk, but we'll go a bit further into what authentication is. And more importantly, how Fordrock has tried very hard in recent years to, and hopefully has succeeded, in making authentication more intelligent. So to understand how we've made it more intelligent, it's important to understand how it was unintelligent in the past. Um, so we have what we call PAM, the Pluggable Authentication Module System, um, from developed originally, I believe, from Sun Microsystems in, in 1995, these concepts uh, came along, and later dropped into Java um, as a framework called Jazz. In the old world, you simply had a series of authentication, what were called modules, one after another. The uh, most simple of these was username and password. You collect a username and password. You'd mark that module as being success successful or a failure. Um, either the user managed to do that or they didn't. And that was your only authentication challenge. Um, you could combine multiple of these types of authentication modules in a chain. So if you had your second factor, uh, say your uh, code verification uh, check that you wanted to perform after your username and password, you would have to place your username and password module, and then you'd have to place uh, your, your, your code uh, checking module directly afterwards. And although you had some control over the nature of how the user were to interact with these modules, it was limited, especially in the PAM and, and Jazz world, to these four flags. Now, I don't want to bore you or, or, or frustrate you by going into too much detail about these, but essentially you could mark any given module as required. So you, you had to perform this module. Requisite, you must have performed this module before you get to later modules in the chain. Optional, you don't really have to do this, but it's maybe useful if you do. Or sufficient, which is slightly weird, but it says if you've already achieved all of the requisite or at least one of the required modules prior to this module, then congratulations, your authentication is successful. Now, there's an issue with the way that this is presented specifically to administrators, which is that it's very, very hard to understand all of the different flows that a user could take through any given authentication journey unless that administrator not only understood all of the concepts around these different uh, frameworks, but also the specific actions that the individual uh, modules can take and all of the flows within those modules. That's a lot for an administrator to be expected to know to be able to configure different journeys for their users to be able to take. Yeah, so I guess just the, the problem that, that was being solved here, this is back in the day kind of stuff, which is if you know the same shared secret that I know, password, then you can get logged into this system. 
And over time, we try to augment that by putting things on at the, at the back end, you know, another factor. And it became really kind of tedious. And it didn't really um, address some of the attack vectors that uh, we've started to see. You know, what if, if Andy logs in from, um, from his laptop here at 6 p.m. or 6.45 in the evening from the BCS, is that more or less risky than Andy logging in from Beijing on an Android laptop? <laughs> well, it depends. What does he normally do? What's his behavior? You know, what about, um, is this a device that he's used before? If it is something he's used before, is that more or less risky than him using a brand new device? And again, Google do some of these things really well where, you know, it'll send you a notification to say, hey, someone's just signed on with your credentials on this new device. Is that you? You know, so, um, so, so this, this old model wasn't able to address some of the uh, reasons for uh, some of the new attack vectors that were coming in. So one of the major uh, concerns about this is the fact that these were linear chains. As Andy says, you have to treat every user as an equal citizen in that world, which means that if you decide to challenge users with their, uh, with their code generator, every user is going to be challenged with a code generator. And if you don't want to do that, then your engineer is going to have to specifically code in an understanding of uh, that option and be able to code uh, a code path through their module to allow for the case where the user may or may not want to add in uh, this code generator. So as I mentioned before, this becomes confusing for administrators, but it also becomes a problem for developers as they have to maintain and develop more and more complex code. And that code becomes not only complex within the code itself, but it has to understand the context in which that code is going to be used. This isn't a good design paradigm for writing your programs, but it also adds friction for users as they have to go through all of these mechanisms when actually, as Andy's described there, they might be a low risk chance of them having any of these concerns. So well, how, should, should, oh, we, sorry. should we jump in and show people oh, what it looks like? If you want to go straight to it, sure. Um, just it becomes more real at that point. Um, I think we can do that right now. So um, what I'm going to do is just show you a little uh, demonstration of what we're talking about here. Um, this is down the network. Stand the network on. So um, what I've got on my laptop is I've got a um, I've got Tomcat running on my laptop. I've got the, one of the Forge Rock products, or multiple Forge Rock products, installed running in Tomcat over here. I've got Directory Server, for instance, um, and something called Access Management. And um, I'm going to go into the administration console right now, and I'll try and do this with using one hand only. I'll do it. And this is the, uh, this is the administration uh, console for configuring authentication. And we've got this new concept called trees. Now, what is a tree? Well, can, we, can we just show the modules interface first okay. to make sure that we've uh, fully explained how it, how it used to work? So we still support this way of doing things. Um, and it's still available in the product. But straight away from the UI, you can see uh, <laughs> it becomes a little hard to grasp, even if you spend quite a lot of investment in making a pretty UI to try and make it obvious what's happening. So I'll try and explain what happened here. Right? So this is, so this is a chain, one, two, three, four. And you, ex you enter the top of the chain, and you come down the bottom. The first one is basically asking for username and password. And we're, we're saying here that once you've done that, we fall down. Whether you fail or not, we fail down is this next one. And this one is basically saying, is this a device that we know about already? Have we seen this device before? Now, if you've got that right and you got this right, you can exit over here, uh, exit early, effectively. But if you're on a new device, what we're going to do is now use a one-time password, which will email or, or send, get to you some other way. And then you have to enter that correctly. And if you do that, at this point, we then remember, we take a hash of that device that you came in from, and we store that on your user profile so that next time you come around, you can exit early. So it becomes a little bit easier. So the user experience the first time is username and password and a one-time password, which is a, pass a key code. And then after that, you can just use username and password on that same device. But that's not obvious from this. And um, so, so that's why this was very rigid, very linear, and we tore it up and threw it away. So what we then came up with was something called authentication trees. And the way trees go, it's effectively a way of modeling what the authentication journey is going to look like. So it works something like this. And I'm going to have to put the microphone down again, I'm afraid. 
So um, to create the tree, you just give it a name. So um, PCS, let's call it the British Society Tree, PCS. And then you put into this kind of like a, a palette, you've got a palette of nodes down the left-hand side, so you break out into little nodes, different sets of nodes. And on the right-hand side, you start to model your flow. So just so we get our orientation here, let's model the the flow that we all love and we all hate, which is this username and password. So for that, what you need to do is you need to collect the username, you need to collect the password, you're going to compare them against the authority of the store, like an LDAP directory, and we just wind, wire them up like this, or we'll simulate success nodes with uh, some of these. Um, and so if I just wire this up like this, uh, three goes to success, false will stay and fail, and save that. And then in an incognito window, the incognito window, I'm going to exercise that tree. So if I go um, over here and then I explicitly use the tree you just created, which is uh, service equals PCS. So this is the stage that is collecting my username. Um, this is the stage that collects my password. And then I get logged in because I consulted them against the directory and this is correct. So I landed my user profile page, which indicates success. So that's how you create a tree. But um, if we look at some of the trees that we've got, uh, that we prepared earlier, um, you can start to address things like um, teaching people on mobile devices might be um, a smart thing to do because you want to be kind of like sympathetic to the device that people are using. So for instance, you can have something like this where we say, ask for the username, if he's on a mobile device, let's use a mechanism which is sympathetic to that device. It's called like a push notification. So what would happen is um, I get a push notification, I use my face or my finger to um, accept that push notification, and then I get logged in. Um, so I can, uh, I can't really show that very easily to you. You can log, in, log into Backstage? Yeah, I'll do that. So incognito window. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna go to a site which is at Ford's Rock. So we use it ourselves here, and I'm going to sign in. Um, so we're going to sign in using my uh, credentials, like this. But then we're going to go to a second stage where, both on my watch and on my phone, I'm being sent a push notification. So I'm going to click on that. I'm going to use Face ID. You can use Face ID here, right? That doesn't doesn't work. There we go. So I'm going to actually do that again. send a push notification here and then if I swipe right that's going to try and use face ID and it's going to fail hopefully right fail my gear source system says it failed and so I'm going to try it again and this time it worked and on the screen I got logged in okay so that's using um, authentication mechanism which is using the phone um, again if I was doing all this on the phone so you wouldn't have seen it so that's why I put it on here I would have used the mechanism of the sympathetic glass device. Face of you. Yeah, sure. So, so I, well, actually, what we're doing here is we're leveraging Apple's technology, Face ID, which allegedly, uh, from, from Cook told me, is, um, uh, is uh, it, it deals with that kind of thing, right? Because um, some of the things that I'm not going to just buy Apple's Face ID technology and put it together, but Tim tell, tells me it's wrong. <laughs> okay, so um, so that was an example of using uh, of, of a tree here where we're, we're branching. We're saying if you're on a mobile device, use one mechanism. Um, if you're on a desktop device, use a different one. Another example might be to counter some of the attacks that we see right now, such as bots. Right, the majority of authentication transactions that happen on the internet today are not conducted by human beings. There's bots in billions of a day are trying to get into those accounts. So here's a tree that tries to mitigate that risk. So the first thing it does is it throws you into a recapture of uh, phrase. Like, so this is a node which will use Google recapture. Is that people familiar with recapture? Yeah. Yeah? It's like traffic lights and, and, and yeah. 
Well, the, the latest version of that actually is even smarter. They're using um, smart technologies on the server side to basically make that less friction free. So by this time, if you get through this node, you are not a bot. Then you can use, this is a node that actually um, calls to a third party server. One of the nice things about this platform is that it's very open. And this is a community written node, which goes and talks to a REST interface across the internet. And this service basically maintains a database of risky people or risky IP addresses and names. So if you are a bad guy or somebody that's naughty or sexual, so if you get through this, this will tell you whether you're malicious or malignant. If you're malicious, well, maybe you just fail the authentication together then. So before you even ask for who you are, the username collector, we've established you're not a bot and you're not on the naughty list. So now what you can do is enter this tiny hole. So this is another note which consults a third party service called Have I Been Pwned? I don't know if people have heard about this, but Have I Been Pwned um, was a service that was established by Tori Holmes, who's big in the security world. And he basically made, he, he gathered all of the credentials that have been involved in breaches around the world. So, you know, the Equifax breach, Ashley Madison breach, what's the most recent one? You know, he gathered all those credentials and stored them in a hash database. And what this does is it basically says, has your username, the credential that you've just given me here, has that been involved in a breach? Yeah, that's what that's doing. So if it has, what should we do? Well, it depends on, on the service that you're offering. And if it's a bank, you might want to be really concerned about that. If it's fantasy football league, you're probably less bothered about that. And so um, you can choose because this me mechanism allows you to choose and branch to determine something else. This little example here is saying, if you have been pwned, if your credentials have been used, use stronger authentication, maybe like a second or third factor. Otherwise, use a more friction-free way of logging in. So that gives you an example of modeling customer journeys and adapting in real time the level of security you need to apply based upon the service you're trying to get access to. That good enough? So the interest of our first uh, part down the malicious group was collecting the uh, passwords and just sending them over to the front. Made it look like they're cheap. Um, yes. Yes. So, um, in fact, I've got a use case for that with a key level agency in the US. But can we use this to effectively make the attacker that we think is suspicious, can we um, send him to a honeypot so that we can see what he was really after in the first place? So we redirect him. We say he appears to, he thinks we've tracked it, I'm in. But he's really being taken over to a honeypot where he can't do any harm. And basically, we can gather information to use against them. Yeah, it's a good example, actually. Um, I, I wonder whether or not I should do web authentication at this point as well, because we're using usernames and passwords a lot here, and we hate usernames and passwords. Do if you, you, you want to keep going the demos, go for it. Yeah, we'll talk about some of the uh, underpinning engineering principles behind what's actually happening here uh, for those of you that are slightly more interested in the programmatic nature of this uh, in, in a moment. But yeah, you're on a roll, so why don't you keep, uh, keep going? Okay, so there's an emerging standard called web authentication um, and FIDO. People heard of FIDO, FID, Fast Identity Online? And the problem it's trying to solve is, is the password problem. The, there are too many passwords. We've got too many services, too many sets of usernames and passwords, so we need to fix that somehow. And the way the FIDO works, um, and web authentication is part of FIDO, is that it um, mints a public key and a private key pair for each resource that you're trying to get access to. And what it does with that is it, it then stores the private key on a device. Typically, it'll be a USB fob like this. There's one for lightning and whatever. I've got a few of these up here. Or it might be on the platform itself, like your Mac or your Windows machine might have a secure element on. So you can store your private key in there. So when you register, we mint these two, two new credentials and um, we store the one in the private key on your um, uh, local device and we the public key gets sent to the back end and stored with your profile. Um, what that then means is that when you, are, um, when you try and authenticate using web authentication, we send a challenge to you, but we send a challenge that's encrypted using your public key. Right? So the challenge might be uh, add one to this random number, and it's encrypted using the public key. 
Okay, so by the time you get it, only the guy on the client side that has access to the private key can understand what that challenge was really about. So he, he decrypts the challenge, he adds one to it, he signs it again with his key and sends it back to the back end, whereby the public key is used again to check that the answer was correct. So it's a mashup of challenge response with PKI. And it's really neat, and, and it works something like this. So um, let's have a look at how my trees look. I've got um, a tree here, which is called, the, um, this is gonna do the registration phase where we're gonna mint some new credentials. So up until here, we are gonna um, establish who you are using whichever mechanism is good for you. So for instance, um, is anyone here from the NHS? No, okay, yeah? Okay, so in the NHS right now, you have to use a smart card to get access to many of your devices. Right? Um, so in the wards, in GP surgeries, whatever, you're using a smart card type of technology. So you could use that existing technology to establish to a fairly high degree of assurance that you are who you claim to be. And then you could go and do this magic here, which is to generate the web authentication credentials. Um, so um, the second tree I'm gonna use is the authentication flow itself, which is very simple because we're just simply going to say, who are you? And now let's do this, this dance. So the best way of seeing this is for me just to demonstrate this in action. So let me log out over here and um, I'll go through the, uh, the registration phase to start with. So this is going to ask me for my username, my password. Okay, and at this point, what's happened uh, is that the browser has detected a challenge that's been sent down, which is to, we're gonna mint these new credentials, public key, private key, and we're gonna stick the private key somewhere. Should we stick it on a USB security key? So shall I plug in one of these keys? Or shall I use the built-in key, which is like touch ID? So what I'm gonna do in here is I'm gonna use my finger to touch my touch ID here, and I get logged in. Now that's registered a new pair of credentials and I'm logged in. But what I can then do in future is I, I just go to the web authentication tree. I just need to say who I am. And after that, I just use my finger to get logged in there like that and I'm logged in. So no passwords were used in that second phase there. So you can use web authentication as a passwordless alternative here. Or you can use it in conjunction with, you know, so you do use name password and then you do this. But it's a really neat technology and um, we think it's really going to take off. Uh, anything else you want to say on that? No, I think I'm, I'm okay. Okay, let's get back on track then. <laughs> <laughs> so we may have to, uh, oh, you, you may have spoiled some of the slides uh, uh, moving forward, but uh, yeah, as, as we can see, uh, let's talk about how Fordrock actually uh, uh, executes this flow. Um, each of those stages that you just saw back and forth um, between the browser and the server there, communicates through uh, a series of uh, callbacks. Um, and the information that you present to those callbacks is then stored in an authentication session uh, in the form of JOTs. Uh, JOTs are JSON web tokens and Fordrock loves JOTs. They are uh, incredibly easy technology to use. They are simply uh, dishonified uh, information. So information represented as key value pairs uh, in, in, in a JSON format, base 64 encoded. Um, but the lovely thing about them is you can sign them, you can encrypt them, and there's 100,000 libraries out there to do all this very, very quickly. Um, so as the stages of any authentication mechanism uh, are represented by callbacks, we have access to various types of callbacks, name callbacks, password callbacks, text output callbacks. The value of uh, abstracting these uh, information gathering and collecting points as callbacks is that clients, uh, the, the thing rendering your uh, login journey, only have to understand how to render a given callback type to be able to render an infinite number of different authentication combinations of those callbacks. And importantly, journeys are designed as graphs. They're not trees. We call them trees because that was a more exciting term for our marketing team to use. I apologize profusely to the people in this room for that. Um, they allow for loops, so you can go round and round if you have problems. They allow for you to check the number of times that you've gone through a loop if you need to. Um, and you don't just have to take a, a study path. Do you want to? Public key. 
Yep, you can you can call into subtrees as well. I don't know if you wanted to show an example of that. Maybe 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 afterwards or so. Uh, let's let's stick on the presentation for a, for a few more minutes if, if that's okay. Um, but yes, you can also call into subtrees uh, subtrees uh, subgraphs as well. Um, and how do we get the information from one node in that graph to the next? Well, we transfer the state. Uh, within these dots that we're passing back and forward. And by doing it with dots, we allow this to be done statelessly. So we, you're not required to hit the same machine in your cluster of authentication uh, uh, servers each time you come back, each time we can assess what you've got and get you to the right point in the uh, uh, journey. Now, we've noticed there are three types of uh, state information you may want to transfer as you're performing your authentication journey. Um, so shared state. When we collect your username, we, short, we store that in a shared state. That means that the data store decision node later on can access that to say, well, what was the username that was previously entered? But we have some more secure types of state as well. So we have transient state. Transient state is state that will only remain within the authentication session so long as the nodes subsequently following it don't require any user input. So, so long as there is no transfer of that information back to the client. And this allows the uh, TV to turn off. Um, but then it comes back on again, so it's fine. So transient state is uh, uh, a very useful if you want to perform a password collection and then do your data store decision. It means that we don't have to worry about putting your password into that uh, jot that we're sending back to the client. Um, and while, as I've said, you can encrypt and sign those things, uh, it uh, allows us to avoid ever opening up that risk from occurring in the first place. And finally, we have a secret state. And the secret state is basically transient, but you need that information later anyway. It's a slightly awkward use case, but we did discover uh, reasons for it. And essentially, a node can, de can declare, and, and we'll see the code in a moment, um, what its outputs will be and a node can declare what inputs it requires to be able to operate. And our framework will look at the tree that you're traversing and determine if information stored in the transient state is actually going to be required later on. And uh, despite the fact that we're, we're going back to uh, the user. And in that case, we perform on your behalf, without telling you, the encryption of that data. And this avoids the case where an administrator may set up a system that would expose a password because they've forgotten to enable signing and encryption on the jots that are going back and forth between the user agent and the server. Um, it's important that we don't enforce things like signing and encryption because we want administrators to have as much flexibility and choice over the way that they configure the system as possible. And obviously, those are very expensive operations. So that was where the demo was going to be, but we've already done that, so we can skip this slide. You've seen that interface, it's beautiful. Um, what did we do for the developer? So that, that's all stuff that we've done for the administrator to help ease the burden of knowledge on the administrator so that anybody can come into their organization and start configuring uh, these things. How does a developer... Oh. Can I just make a point here? One, yep. one, of the principles that we used, uh, one of the principles we used when we were designing Authentication 2 here is that each of these things, which we call nodes, should be very, very a single function. So if you remember back to the good old days of, of Unix and Linux and pipes, you know, so you could take the output of one and send it into the next one, we wanted to have that kind of process. So each of these things should just do one thing very, very well, and don't try and complicate it. And then the power of this comes from joining these things together in an appropriate kind of flow. Okay. Sorry, David. Of course. So uh, for those of you that have been itching to actually see some code, well, here's the entire interface for how to develop a node. Um, it's written in Java, as the Fordrop platform uh, for the most part is. Um, and we have one significant function, process. And process simply returns us the action that we want to perform next. And usually that is go to the next node. We also have a metadata allowing us to describe the configuration required for any given node. And you can simply uh, write in the required uh, configuration in the form of I require a map of, say, string to string, which allows you to render in the uh, UI console you saw earlier a configuration 
for, uh, for that information. Now, I'm not sure if you actually showed any of the configuration when you were doing the demo a moment ago. It may be useful to jump into that. So here's the configuration on the right-hand side. You can see here that for the web authentication node, uh, this is the, I think this is the 6.5. No, this is the 7 version of the, uh, the node. We're, we're working on this at the moment. But you can see that here we've got a relying party identifier. Uh, it's an optional configuration component, but it's simply marked as a string in the code for your uh, engineer. The origin domains is a list, and so our, UA, our, UA, our UI is able to render this as a list of strings as a set of origin domains. Uh, we have an enum below, which allows you to select one of a preset configuration sections. We have a Boolean, allowing recovery codes. It's been kind of incredible how I managed to get all of these into this node. Um, it's just like I did it for a demo, but I didn't. This is quite great. Um, and the timeout then allows you to set a number. And because it's an integer, the, the UI will render you a little uh, uh, up and down tab there for, for getting that integer as close as possible. So what we've tried to do is ease uh, engineers into writing these nodes and getting these nodes out as quickly as possible. And the value of this is that engineers, once they're familiar with the framework, can really start pumping these things out. I don't know where we're going now. This is exciting. So, um, so we have um, a community, you mentioned the word community out there. So we have this uh, thing called the marketplace where community members can write nodes and share them with other members. So if we look at the nodes that are available for authentication node, um, we have pages and pages of third party. Some of these things are commercial, so there might be nodes that talk to services and that's have a subscription to that service because they use these nodes. So we have integration with different people like Yubico, Symantec, people that you may know a lot. Uh, Threat Metrics is a, is a new one that was published just last week. Um, and so these can all augment the authentication process. Um, um, and the good news about all of this, if I just choose at random one of these pages, um, I'm going to Google Lead Capture Node. Um, I just click on this, you can see that we make the, each, each of these nodes has a kind of little readme about how to build, how to use these things. And it also, the good news is we have the source code here as well. So we make the source code available for all of these things uh, for everyone on GitHub. So if you want to write the node, typically you scan through here, find one that's kind of like the one that you want to write, down to the source, it's a hack of a lot. Yep. Uh, one other thing to note on the marketplace is also the uh, addition of the tags that we put on those uh, nodes, indicating whether uh, they are community nodes, and we've allowed them up there, but we take no responsibility for them, whether we've verified them ourselves as Fordrock, or whether our partners have verified them for us. Uh, the value of this is we can give different levels of assurances to people interacting with us on the marketplace. Uh, it, it's called a marketplace, but I think most of the nodes are, are actually free to download because, as you see, the source code is available. So there's some other functions available here. There's the get inputs and the get outputs that I mentioned earlier to allow us to do this uh, analysis and stepping through the graph. Um, and there's some audit entry details in case you want to do some specific additional logging or auditing that is not covered by the framework for you. But if we move to the next slide, you will see the entire code for the username collector node. And this is as simple as uh, a node can really get. There is no configuration for a username collector node because all you're doing is collecting a string. So what does our process function do? Well, our process function has two options. Either the user is coming to this node having filled in the username input field, or, uh, and thus we want to process it and move along the graph, or the user is coming to this node and they've just hit the node for the first time, so we need to tell the user interface to render a, uh, a username callback for them. And we do that here just through this uh, little bit of code here. So we can easily say, get the callback called name callback, and then we're going to get the function get name out of that callback, and we're going to say, is that name empty or is it null? And if it is, then we're going to say, collect the username. And collect the username will simply log collecting username and return a new name callback using the locale identifier callback.username. This allows the uh, locale to be worried about entirely separately from the code itself. In the case where we do have this function and it is completed, it is not null or empty, then we will say 
go to the next node in the tree uh, because there is only a single outcome from this node and replace the shared state that you're going to move on to by copying the existing shared state and adding in our username into that shared state. Then we call dot build on that and we're done. Finally, our outputs are simply declared as our username output state. Yeah, of course. Uh, name callback is actually uh, uh, in the Java uh, framework since 2004 or so, so that's definitely available, yes. Um, I think all of our callbacks, and I, and I, I don't want to overstep the boundaries. We used to be completely open source. We're not so much anymore, um, but a lot of the authentication framework work, and especially the nodes and the trees, is open source. Um, I believe that all of this stuff should be available, and it's certainly available to our customers if they simply send us a message asking us. Um, but yes, you can also add new callbacks so long as you're implementing the, the callback interface, which is defined by uh, the, the, the Java uh, uh, standard already for us. Um, if anybody's interested in seeing much more complex nodes, such as the web authentication node and the code behind it, uh, which is far more than the 70 or so lines of code here, I'd be willing to, to show you that afterwards. Again, we don't have any secrets because we're trying to do authentication and security here. Yeah. So, yeah, so I can answer that question directly. Um, there are two options for that. The first is the default logging, auditing, and metrics that are available simply out of the box by using the framework. And that is done any time you move from node to node. We'll log anything that those nodes ask us to log. We'll make those uh, metrics available for real-time analysis or off-time analysis in terms of number of authentications. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe including... Uh, um, Sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. Uh, but to do much more complex things, all you have to do is develop a node to do that. And Fordrock offers out of the box a series of nodes for metric gathering and collection. So one of the use cases for that is, say you have a branch where you will go through a one-time password uh, collection on one side, and you'll go through a web authentication password another, based on a user choice. Maybe you present the user with, how would you like, what multi-factor would you like to use? Would you like to use a phone for push? Would you like to use web authentication or would you like to use a one-time password? And all of your users are selecting one-time password. How would you know that? Well, you simply put a node that collects that state and publishes that out so that you can reference that later. And you can add more of these, uh, such as timer nodes, to allow you to see how quick the journey is for all these authentication attempts. Um, and you can make all of this available and all this information is available um, directly out of the logging and auditing provided by the framework. So yes, it's, it's very, very definitely uh, capable of doing those things. I've, there's actually a slide uh, mentioning those later and I think we have maybe some examples of these. Yeah, I mean, I think your original question was like, can you hook this into a, a risk engine that the bank may have? You know, a lot, lot of banks have, or different um, financial institutions, have their own in-house fraud detection mechanisms. And what we can actually do is you can actually write a node which can go and call that fraud detection mechanism over the net and you can say, give me, give me a risk score back here. And based upon that risk score, you can then determine how the authentication flow would then continue. You know, if this is a really risky transaction, according to my risk engine, maybe I want to like um, deny the transaction altogether, or maybe I want to get him to go and use his face or his finger to to authenticate that transaction. And we're going to come on to that, uh, if time permits, really soon. Mm -hmm. um, but this is another example of what David was on about, whereby this is saying, click the username, have a transparent node here that collects the IP address, as long as you can rely on it. And you may want to collect that just because you're doing some kind of analysis on where, is your, where are your customers coming from? EMEA, uh, Asia Pacific, America. And you may just increment these kind of fields here. These are very simple counter fields that we can stick into a node. Then you can say, hey, is this on a mobile uh, um, user here? If so, maybe increment the mobile counter. And we expose all these metrics through, um, quite often our customers use things like Prometheus or Grafana 
to, uh, which is a standard, they're open source uh, monitoring tools, which can look at these metrics that we're gathering. And so you can see in real time on the dashboard, where are all my transactions coming from? Um, we also look at like what, what browsers are com people coming in here. And maybe it's a trusted browser. You know, you may trust something like Chrome, but you may think IE is an untrusted browser. Now, the reason for picking up that kind of context is that you may just stick that on the downstream session so that the application that is sitting behind this authentication, that is relying on this authentication, gets the idea that this user's okay, he's, he's authenticated correctly, we trust him, but the environment in which he's operating, like this browser, might be untrusted. And so you might want to give a hint in the session that you know, this might be a browser which may be suspect to uh, easy attacks. So, um, so anyway, that was a long answer. The answer is write a node that talks to your risk engine. Is there another question? Yeah. Um, about policy logs that mm -hmm. you Yep, uh, I don't know if you want to show the, the interface for that. I don't know if we have time right now. Maybe we could be able to show you exactly that afterwards. But yes, all that information is logged and stored, and you can set the output type of your uh, audit and logging information to wherever you wish it to be. Um, you can do auditing either at the tree level, so just minimal I information that so-and-so logged in here on a, at this time and date, and he successfully authenticated or failed. You can even do it at the node level as well. So you can actually trace through. Each of these nodes can log audit information as well. So you can see the path that people took um, and where they potentially where they fell out. You know, um, this, this idea of it's called intelligent authentication because we're, we're able to dynamically use programmatic logic during the process to make sensible decisions about what happens next in this process. You know, is it risky? Let's up, up the authentication level. Um, or throw them out completely, or allow them in, as the example was before, but mark them as, as suspect users, or send them somewhere else. And you're able as well to select where that information gets output to. So if you wanted to go to send it out, then send it out. If you wanted to go to a file, it can go to a file. If you wanted to go straight into a database, then it can go to a database. Um, is it like a simple, uh, simple error log, or is it like Java, or you just kind of decide what it is? Um, so, so, so the logging is usually just, just static logs. They get they get put into uh, in increasing size logs, but the the auditing information is is actually separate um, and can go through whatever auditing handler that you attach to uh, the the access manager. Now, access so, manager itself is a very large product, so it it can be easy to kind of go down a rabbit hole. And we're trying to focus on authentication here, but we can quickly show you the the ones that we so offer. The, the audit information would be sent to whichever one you you choose. It could be flat files, it could be Elasticsearch, it could be a JDBC sync, you know, or maybe Splunk or Syslog, whatever you want. You know, we support a lot of. Um, uh, we can redirect all that inf audit information wherever you want to send it to. I hope that answers the, the question. Uh, yep. One more question, please. Uh, sure. Like, You have control of everything that you're configuring within the Fordrock environment itself. What information Salesforce sends back to you after you've come back from using a third-party service is up to the third-party service itself. So if they put contextual information about how that authentication succeeded or failed as it comes back to us, then we'll be able to gather and analyze that. So if you go away to use a SAML2 to log into another service, and then your assertion comes back, you know, yes, they've logged in fine with us, and here's the information that we want to uh, you to have or that you've requested as the SP. Um, then we can we, we we can execute upon that if it's provided. Yeah. So this is where uh, I always will be divided into two parts. I have I will not have the full information. Uh, the second part is that indication was succeeded or not. So uh, all, all of the information through uh, any given journey will be connected through transaction IDs. So you'll be able to see. Any, under any given transaction, all of the events that occurred within, say, that authentication journey, that, that, uh, that authentication journey is then also associated with the session information. So you can see information about 
how did the user log in, what, what happened during that, and later for the, for the session itself. Um, so there were a couple of notes about logging and, and, and auditing nodes already. Um, and I think we've hinted at, at a lot of these. Um, so popular underused branches within your trees or even popular and underused trees. Um, for doing A-B testing, maybe you just want a random node that sends half your users off to one side and half users off to the other and sees what the user experience is on those by, by adding timing nodes to see how long it takes. Um, also being able to prove your SLAs by SLIs um, by saying, yes, we have had this level of uh, 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 successful login uh, by our users, and also real-time and, and, and offline metrics. Uh, just know that we're, we're, we're a bit pressed for time. Um, so what we also wanted to quickly touch on are some of the ideas about taking uh, the information that you gather during authentication a little bit further. And this is one of my uh, uh, favorite little graphs. It's so, so obvious, so basic. Um, but essentially, it's your assurance level over time. Uh, when you first log into a service, if this green node is your initial login to a service and you get minted a session, say with Facebook, great, you're logged in. You then close your laptop and 10 months later you open your laptop and you go to facebook.com and yay, you're still logged in. That's really useful. Great customer experience. But what's the assurance that that user is still there? Well, straight after the login event occurred, your assurance starts to drop until the point where it's essentially meaningless um, to a user. Now, in the traditional world, there are a couple of approaches to this. Step up authentication is one. I've dropped my assurance level over time, but then I tried to perform some action. Let's go back to that banking example that I mentioned earlier. I want to perform a transaction. So we challenge them to prove who they are again at a higher level. And we go, great, now you've proved who you are using MFA as well. Fantastic. So we'll up the level of authentication that you have in that session. And now you can perform more actions. But of course, over time, the level of assurance there drops off again. So one way of doing this is to use what we call transactional authorization. And that is to bounce up your session level only for the single action or single resource request that you've uh, decided to execute at that time. And then we drop your session level back down again. But you're still stuck with this problem that over time, the assurance granted to you by the single authentication event that your user took place in is actually going to fade. So there are uh, a couple of models around, uh, or, or a couple of names given to improving this. And Carter is one of them, but Zero Trust is the much cooler name for it. Um, and essentially this is, you've authenticated, but it doesn't really matter that you've just authenticated because we're always going to be continually analyzing, checking, validating that your session is doing the types of things that your session should be doing. So we gather context during your authentication. We could gather your IP address. We can gather your location. We can gather the time. We can compare that then when you try and perform uh, uh, events, when you try and uh, access resources through our authorization system to say, well, are you still trustworthy? Are you still operating within the same context that you originally authenticated with, or has something changed? Are you doing something that's out of the ordinary? I've got a man shaking his head in the audience there, and I'm interested to know why. <laughs> Um, so if we move forward, there is, I think uh, we don't have time for a, a demo of this, but I've managed to shove a little GIF in um, here at the end, um, and that's, that's doing uh, just this. So here's a tree that will uh, do a very basic context collection. It will save your IP address. It's going to store it in the profile called given name, and this is simply so that on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll be able to see it. Uh, displayed in the user profile information. So this is very much a demo of these uh, ideas, but it's not necessarily uh, something you'd ever want to use in the real world. You log in um, through this, and we've stored your local host address uh, uh, in your first name. So now we're going to log out. If we go to the next slide, you'll see the execution of this at a later date. Now, this is slightly tricky to see, obviously, um, but if you log in, here we have a zero trust demo. And uh, we have uh, this previous uh, login that we had where we stored your IP address. And we know that the user logged in originally at 127.0.0.1. So we're going to add some context to the request they sent to the authorization server, the policy enforcement point. And it's going to be able to return us all of the information from the resource, because our context at the point of authorization matches that of authentication. Um, but what if that IP address uh, changes? So if that IP address now changes to 127.0.0.2, well, the policy enforcement point still allows the request through, but on return, 
we redact some of the information that the user is allowed to see. So while we still trust that the user is authenticated, we don't trust that their context hasn't changed. So something's gone a little bit strange, maybe, or something we don't quite trust. And so we can remove information as we come out. And as I indicated at the start of the talk, it's not just redaction that we do. We could simply log out that user and say, no, your context has changed. You must re-log in. Or we could say, you know, any, basically any number of, of, of topics. Um, I think we're basically that for time, unfortunately, um, and, and that for slides as well. But we do have time for questions if people have them, and we'd love to answer them. Um, I don't know if you need to jump in and, and, and tell people they're free to leave. Well, you made a question to me. Are there any burning questions still? So, yeah, so if I could just explain that. The different uh, analysts in this space, um, Gartner, Forrester, Cooper Cole, they use different terms for this. But effectively, it's the same thing, which is if you ask any CISO, um, you know, can, is that device um, always pristine or is it, is it at risk of being hacked? He's going to say it's going to be hacked at some point. What about your network? Are there going to be malicious actors on your network? Uh, well, probably, yes, there will be. So if you can't trust your device, you can't trust your network, what can you trust? Well, the answer is nothing. That's the zero trusting. Don't trust anything. So every time you do a, a transaction, you need to establish the, you're at the correct assurance level to perform that transaction. That's the idea behind all of this. Um, and one way of doing that is simply to have, as, as David explained, have this idea of create a hash of the context at the time you authenticated and then measure that hash again at the time you do your transaction. And if things have changed, do something, like ask them to re-authenticate, redact the content. There's lots of different um, reactions you can do at that point. So Carter is Gartner's um, name. It stands for continuous, hang on, no. It's behind you, mate. <laughs> continuous adaptive risk. <laughs> Look behind you, it's pantomime season. <laughs> Um, continuous Adaptive Risk and Trust Assessment. That's what it stands for. But it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah, maybe I uh, explain to them why, why uh, what, what schemes are this. I have my doubts about MC hmm. Arts. MC, uh, and you said about this, uh, that well, well, somehow, well, I mean, you, you, you keep track of, I mean, are they behaving? continuously change and when it's, it's open yeah, to, to be hacked by users and um, uh, it will over the long term uh, uh, will lead to the detriment well, either in terms of, of, of bothering users or well, creating worse, worse problems um, uh, for, for, for the, well, if you like, the legitimate ones, yeah, whereas well, I mean, those who, who want to play the system well, are invited to do that because any system that, that breaches principle of not allowing executable content for input from a user. So therefore it has to be legit. So one of the uh, ideas that we are exploring and have implemented, uh, for example, is machine learning on a user session. So does a session, uh, does a user, say John, always log in uh, and at the same time from the same location, perform similar kind of actions? Is the first thing they do when they open their computer to check their email? and then to open their IDE, and then start working? Or are they suddenly doing something strange? Now, you don't necessarily have to interrupt the user at the point when they do that. You can simply put a flag on that user's account saying, oh, this maybe scored a plus one in, in interest that we might want to analyze. So it's not that you have to interrupt or create friction at the exact time when the event occurred, but it allows you to gain an idea. And by using, obviously, the kind of growing machine learning technology to be able to gather a idea of what your average user does, then these techniques can be, can be combined. But I do concede your point that it is possible, uh, if, if you wish to, 
to, over time, gain these systems. But we're often talking millions of users over millions of millions of sessions. Um, so we can usually get quite a good idea about what the average person does. Um, and if we want to think about an, any individual, then we can also write code specifically for, for, for that purpose. But, We, 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 we would, I, I specifically, and we as Fordrop would never condone that these things should be consented to uh, yeah, at all yeah. times, and it should be expressly indicated that these things are going on. I'm, I, 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 entirely, I entirely concede those points. I, I would never argue against them. I'm a massive proponent of, of, of consent and informed consent. Um, but the technology that we're building is slightly detached from necessarily the laws that have to uh, implement in any given arena. For example, in America, they don't have GDPR. So they wouldn't have to do any of these types of things. So, Although the California Act came into the... Oh, has it actually come? Okay. No, it's it's in America, they do have GDPR. Yeah. <laughs> just, the, just California. But I, 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 th I think the important point to note is that the technology can be separated from some of those concerns that you have, yeah. and we are trying here to present the technology. Um, and while those concerns, the philosophical, the societal implications are very, very important to us, uh, they may not necessarily be important to some of our customers. And we have to walk a line as a business to be able to develop technology that we, we can sell. I, I think it's a great point that over time, the attack vectors will change and people will try and game the system. Um, our customers um, use our, our customers are typically large enterprises that are offering services to their customers. Um, certain of our banks' uh, customers have like maybe 1,800 applications all hooked into, um, into this. And what they want to do is when, when, like, you know, two years ago, fingers, fingers were the things that you authenticate like this year or last year is faces. What's it going to be in two years' time? It's going to be something else. They don't want to have to redesign an authentication system for 1,800 applications, rip out something uh, to replace it with some new, with some new technology or whatever, DNA, DNA testing. Um, it's just a, it's a ridiculous thing, but the neat thing about this architecture of being able to add nodes is you can replace how you do authentication without touching those 1,800 applications. Because typically your authentication subsystems in large um, organizations are going to be there for the long term. So you need to ensure that they are going to be malleable. You're going to be able to add to them and be able to adapt to new risk um, vectors, I guess. I agree with that. I should also point out that the gentleman at the back speaking is uh, also a member of our organization, which is why he's uh, talking like that. Um, but yeah, do, do please approach us afterwards, and, and, and Wayne especially will oh, happily talk about that. But. Talk about this.